How's it going? Charles Botenston here. We're going to be talking about a topic. I got a, a couple of notes over here to make sure that I cover everything, but I just actually had someone at the gym ask me, and very smart guy, except I need to know the difference between a condo and co-op. Just had a buyer, again, very intelligent, and, and the way they were going into the purchase, I said, as much as we want to do co-ops right now, we got to focus on condos. So this is the thing is, we're going to go over the difference, the basic difference, the legal difference, and obviously um, other just terms, you know, maintenance, common charges, taxes, you know, how much is, is written off and things like that. So first of all, the difference between the boards. Okay, I, I would say that that's the biggest thing that, that from there, everything just splinters out. So the first one is that a co-op board can say no. They can say no to you renting, they can say no to you buying. Okay, they can, and they don't even have to give a reason. They just they just say no. You know, I, I've heard of other, you know, some people say it's fair housing, some people say it's financial, some people, you know, whatever the case is, you know, there's obviously a lot of high profile cases of fair housing rules and regulations and laws and everything else, but you have to go in, as long as you're financially prepared, your case for getting into the board is great. And obviously we'll go over some other rules and regulations, co-purchasing, guarantors, gifting, things like that. So first of all, and obviously if you get rejected, you have to put your home back on the market. With a condo, they offer something called the first right of refusal. They have to give it within 30 days so long as they don't ask for additional paperwork. There's a lot of condos that are actually acting like co-ops and the what they'll do is they'll say, listen, here's the first right of refusal. So in other words, you present the board and you say, this person is is looking to buy this person's apartment at this price or whatever the case is and the condo has to say yes or whatever the rules in the in the stipulations are in the contract the pricing everything like that has to be bought by the condo the condo actually has to buy it so they're they're offering they're saying we refuse to buy it you can buy it all right so along with those lines Charles, have you ever thought, have you ever heard of someone, a condo actually going out and buying? Yes, I have. And it actually happened in 2006, 2007. And essentially what condos were doing at that time, prices were skyrocketing. Literally, you went into contract in May. By August, the price is probably 20% higher, 15% higher. So the condo says, actually, we're gonna buy this. So there's a, there was a condo that actually bought the home and flipped it and sold it and made a profit. That's kind of funny. That's great, actually. The other one was that they bought it for a live-in super. So when that happens, the owner obviously gets compensated. The I think the, the listing broker does, but the buying broker does not. So if you're a broker, obviously just consider that. Co-op, what is it? So essentially you have a building. I don't have anything around to say this is a building. <laughs> this is the building. This is your corporation, all right? Within there, they offer shares to each owner. Okay, so if they offer you shares, that share says within this space, obviously if your home is bigger, you have more shares, you pay higher maintenance and things like that, but within these walls, you own the shares to the confines of that area. Then they give you a stock in lease. So the stocks is obviously the, the, the corporation saying you own that area and in the lease gives you the ability to live there, okay? There was actually a recent case of a, a place, I think it was in Gramercy, that they went in, bought, bought a co-op, and then the co-op said, hey listen, uh, actually you're not using it to the way that you said in the co-op package. So in other words, the purchase application came to the co-op, the co-op said, oh, okay, great. You're gonna be using that as a second home. But in fact, people, their son, who's going to NYU, actually moved in. So they said, whoa, you told us it was gonna be a second home and then you have your son that moved in that's going to NYU or whatever school it was. And then they said, no, no, no. So they had to sell it because they revoked the actual lease for them to live there, but they kept the shares because the person still owns it. So they still own the shares, but they have no ability to live there. So you need both the stock, which is the corporation in the lease. In a condo, we'll actually go down a little bit more. So the pros and the cons. So number one, the pros is they are far less expensive. Okay, um, you know, some people say it's 50% of the inventory. I don't think so. There has been a lot of condos that have come online. To me, I think it's more around 35%. And then you obviously has condops, which we'll cover in a bit. They're higher occupancy rates. So in other words, when you're looking to finance a building, you actually have to have a certain amount of people that live in the building that are not investors. You also have a certain amount of people that within the building that is not a single entity. So a single entity is, is, a, is a corporation or a 
person that comes in and buys 10 apartments out of a 20 unit building, something like that. That's unfinanceable, that's not good, all right? So specifically, obviously we talked about not only shares in the corporation, you have something called maintenance. Maintenance is essentially your monthly cost that goes towards the building staff, the electricity, insurance, you know, the utilities, and instead of an individual tax bill, the building, because it's a corporation, receives one and then they divvy it up based on the amount of shares, the percentage of shares. Cons of buying in a co-op are obvious. You could get rejected if you're a buyer. If you're a seller, the buyer could get rejected. On top of that, they obviously have rules and regulations that we've all heard about, whether it's co-purchasing, gifting, guarantor situations, subletting, renovations, everything has to get approved. They have rules and regulations around it. There's nothing you could bring up or against the co-op. If you're a buyer, you just say, well, no, why are they asking for that? Because that's what they require financially, they require a certain amount of money down, certain amount of money in the bank, certain credit score. So you wanna be financially secure going through the board application. And continuing on with that is that foreign buyers, they don't really like it. They, they want a paper trail of US bank. They also want a paper trail of you making money in the United States. So just in case something happens, just in case you stop paying maintenance or just in case you stop paying your mortgage, that they can go after you, they could sue you, all right? That, that's really what it comes down to because a bunch of people came in and they unfortunately ruined it for all the other people that are looking to buy within a co-op. Um, restrictive use of the unit, we already talked about that. And of course, sometimes there is a flip tax. A flip tax is when the seller sells it and there's a flip tax. You know, the, the one exclusive that I have right now, which is very interesting, is that if you're there for three years, then it's 3%. If you're there for four years, it's 2%. If you're there for five years, it's only 1%. So it's 1%, it could be of the net gains, it could be the total purchase price. There's a, a slew of ways they can do that. Condos, buying a real property. Okay? Something you can feel, you can touch, just like a co-op, but you're actually buying the property. Just like a house, just like a townhouse, uh, just like a building, property, things like that, where you, where you actually own the deed, okay? On top of that, there's common charges. Common charges with the tax Taxes, it's together are your monthlies, okay? Um, obviously with the maintenance, that includes taxes and the building common charges. So the common charges obviously go towards, say if there's amenities, or just like I said before, the building staff, the insurance, um, you know, trash, removal, things like that. The pros in buying a condo, you can do whatever you want, essentially, you know, like you can rent it out, you could use it as a second home, you could buy it for your kid, you can be a foreign national, you could put it potentially in an LLC, you can sublet it and then potentially have it also in an LLC, so there's no pass-through liability to the owner where they can go after all the assets just in case something happens. They're also not subject to the ridiculous board approval that kind of co-ops require. They're awful, also a lot easier to sell so long as you price it right. People love condo. The cons are also obvious, is that there's a lot less of them. There's, you know, now with all the inventory coming online, the high-end inventory with the hundreds of units that are being built in Long Island City, downtown Brooklyn, and in Manhattan, you're looking at probably about a 35%, maybe even more, you know, I just read off 50%, it's not that high. Uh, because co-ops have been around forever, they used to be rental buildings, and then the people that were renting it bought shares in the corporation, they couldn't afford the building, so then that's essentially how it happened is that they needed to leverage uh, someone else, a bank or an entity to give them the right to live there. I'm not gonna get into the history of that. The cons of condos is that there's not a lot of them, I already spoke about, which means that the pricing is higher. So a comparable condo to a comparable co-op. So if it's a one bedroom on the Upper West Side and a one bedroom on the Upper West Side and they're side by side in the exact same building, uh, which is impossible, you can't have them in the exact same building. But if they're side by side, same amenities, same monthlies, same everything, Everything, view, finishes, I garner it's gonna be about 30% more expensive. 30% is a lot. So instead of a million, it's 1.3. Or instead of 3 million, it's whatever that amount of money is. Uh, it's almost $4 million, you know? So it, it doesn't sound like a lot, but with less inventory and it's more expensive, it's easier to sell, but the problem is there's not a lot of them, so you're not gonna get your choice of condos unless it's a down market. The last thing I'll talk about is condops. So condops is essentially, this is the legal way of thinking about it, is a co-op formed inside of a condo, and there's only about 5% of the city that are condops, okay? Uh, going down, just wanna make sure that legally everything is, is said properly, is at the bottom of the building, very, very important, the bottom of the building, 
building uh, often has a single condo unit, which is in the form of a commercial or a retail space. And then from there, that is under a condo, but everything else is run like a co-op. You get a maintenance, and like I said, there's only 5% of the city. Residents operate under co-op rules, but the co-op abides by condo rules, okay? So in other words, the same thing when they get uh, tax bills, it's to the entire corporation instead of individually divvied out like it is in condos. And then the last thing I'm gonna say with that is that they do function like co-ops where you have to go through the board approval. Obviously, both of them do, but with condops is that there is an application, there is approval, and you could get rejected. Most of them, they do act like condos. You know, that, that's been the, the fair share. Um, there is one on the upper, on East 77th Street where the maintenance is so high because they essentially had a really bad lease come down to the retail space, the, the commercial space downstairs. They weren't paying their fair share and they wouldn't leave. It was a total disaster. But that's why you have to do your due diligence, which leads me to potentially next week's topic. What is the due diligence that an attorney does so you are protected when you're buying a condo in a co-op? It's something we'll talk about. So if you guys have any questions, leave in the comments below. Hopefully this helped a little bit. I, I recommend obviously condos. It's, it's easier for everyone. They can't say no, especially if you're foreign national or there's a, a situation where it's parents buying for kids or kids buying for parents or co-purchasing or gifting or guarantor situation. Con Condos are the best route, but if, if you're looking out there and you, you don't like any of the inventory, highly recommend that you look at co-ops, but you have to do your due diligence and this is where you have to bring in a professional. Don't hire your, your cousin Louie or your Aunt Millie that's been in the industry for a year or six months or they were a real estate agent in 1993, okay? You need a professional that is actively full-time so they can get you through this co-op because I've heard of just absolute nightmares of people getting rejected after spending months of looking for properties and months of putting together their board application, spending thousands of dollars on the co-op fees and on the attorney, on the bank fees, the application, the appraisal, all these things, and then they get rejected. So work with a professional, please. Just helps everybody out. And it's good for the listing agent. The listing agent is, I, I only want to work with professional buying agents, okay? It makes my job way easier. I know that I'm getting full disclosure going into the co-op process, the contract process, and it protects the owner, it protects the buyer. So if you guys have any questions, leave in the comments below. Have an amazing day. Um, tomorrow, or whenever you're watching this, we're gonna be going over continuing the buying process, and it could be about the, the diligence done by attorneys, which uh, thank God for attorneys, they really protected a lot lot of buyers from buying not good properties and a lot of buyers that were cautious and needed that diligence done by attorneys. So any questions, leave in the comments below. Shoot me an email, charles at bpi.live.